One of the things I noticed while being in Myrtle Beach at the singing all week, for some reason when it come time for the preaching of the Word of God every night, there was a lot of people up walking around just talking. I want to call our attention back to reverence and respect for the Word of God. So we do that by standing if we can stand. And if not, that's fine. God understands. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12 says, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, a door was opened to me by the Lord. I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus my brother. But taking my leave of them, I departed for Macedonia. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one were the aroma of death leading to death and to the other the aroma of life leading to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not, as so many, peddling the word of God. <laughs> but as of sincerity, as of from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We closed out our last message of Paul in verse 11 where he warned us about the devices of old smutty face. The devices of the devil. The tools that Satan uses against us. I want you to know, folk, that Paul never lost sight of who Jesus Christ was. Amen? But let me tell you something. He never lost sight of who the devil was either. He always had his eye on Christ, and he was always looking around at the same time at what the devil might do or was doing. Paul reminds us of that once again. You remember at this point when Paul writes this letter, he refers us back to chapter one, uh, first, uh, the first letter, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 5, where he talked there about a young man who had taken his father's wife, and, and they committed an immorality. This young man was a part of the church family there at Corinth, and, and Paul urged them to remove him, discipline him, get him out. It wasn't good for the church. And the reason they did that was not just to clean the church up because of the immorality that everybody knew about, but it was also to find a place for that young man to be restored back in his fellowship with God and his fellowship with them. Paul referred to it as turning that young man over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. I'm going to tell you something, folks. The devil is always looking for ways to get his foot in the door of the church of Jesus Christ. You're peering around there, aren't you, brother? You're having a hard time seeing me. Go ahead and move around, because I don't want to keep going over here, okay? <laughs> Listen, folk, Satan wants in this place. Satan was just loathing for the opportunity to take that situation of a church discipline that young man and kicking him out of the church so he could use that as an opportunity not only to bring back a stirring up and a, a dividing the church family, but to permeate that out into the community so all of Corinth knew that that church did something so wrong as far as the world would think. But I'm going to tell you something. It was so right for what God's Word says. Flee immorality. Run from it. Get rid of it. You don't need it in your life. But there was also Paul and how he at this weakened point in his life while he was down and discouraged, Satan wanted to use that to bring Paul's attention to the people and the fact that for a long time they didn't do that. They just let that young man come and go. He probably got up here and sang a song. Great is thy faithfulness. Well, imagine what Jesus thought of that. Amen? Because when we sing, we're an instrument 
that could be of glory, but if there's immorality in my life, guess what? God's not going to accept that praise from me. So Paul could have easily allowed Satan to cause him to say, oh, I, just, I despise those people. I'm just done with those Corinthians. All they want to do, all they want to do is throw that back in my face. Oh, how the devil loves it when you and I invite people to this church and someone says, oh, that church. Oh, that church. You talking about fellowship over there on Beaver Dam Road? Didn't they used to fuss and fight? Yeah, yeah. But let me tell you something. That ain't this church. We are not fussing and fighting. Amen? We have made a commitment. We signed a commitment when I came that we were going to work together to promote unity and love toward one another. Amen? That's what the devil wants to disrupt. He would love to get his foot in the door and say, Oh, Bobby, he didn't do this. Oh, that preacher, he didn't do that. And use that to stir us up. People say, Oh, that church. Oh, well, they're not near as good as the church over yonder. Well, guess what? We ain't the church over yonder. We're the church here. We're the church. We, we is who we is. Because we ain't what we ain't. I'll wear that shirt this afternoon. I got it. We, uh, yeah, it says it. Yeah, it's right. And, and it's true. We is who we is because we ain't what we ain't. When the prophet Nathan confronted Paul because of his immorality and the fact that he had the husband of the woman that he fell in love with murdered, you remember what the prophet Nathan said to David? He said, David, you've not only sinned against God, you have given great occasion to the enemy of the Lord to blaspheme the Lord. And that church, or this church, that would allow immorality, any open sin, to be known in this community, it's blasphemy to the Lord. Folk, never forget the devices of the devil and his desire is to destroy everything God is doing right here. We cannot let the devil have an advantage. Say this with me. I am not going to let Satan get in this church. Well, it's more than saying it. We got to work at it. We got to work at it. So he begins in verse 12 and he turns our attention back to the plans that we talked about last Sunday night. As he tries to move toward the goal of going to Macedonia, seeing Corinth on the way, coming back from Macedonia, seeing Corinth and spending a little bit of time with them. And as he makes this transition back to his plans and what he thought God wanted him to do, I want you to notice two things with me this morning. There was a dilemma. Look at verses 12 and 13. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, a door was opened to me by the Lord. I love that. Paul had always desired, once the gospel started spreading in Asia Minor, he always had the desire to go there and preach the gospel. Why not? The door God opened was in Troas. Troas was an incredible place. It was a city of dreams. It was a Roman colony with people everywhere. A seaport venue that people wanted to visit. Lots of people. People that were lost. People that needed to hear about Jesus Christ. And while that must have put a sense of joy in his heart, there was something still heavy on his heart. Look at verse 13. I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus, my brother. So Paul had been in the Mully Grups. We'll have to learn from Acts and other places. But he, he's in the Mully Grups. He's disappointed that the church has not taken care of this sexual immorality in the church, the young man. He sends a letter, the letter that I mentioned to you twice last week. We don't have that letter. It wasn't important to God to put that letter in this Bible that we call Holy Scriptures, this canon 
of Paul. <laughs> God said it, it doesn't need to be there, but whatever was in that letter, Paul was waiting to hear back from Titus of what was going on in the church. And he's down. And he's missing Titus. He misses him badly. Well, guess what? We learned from the scripture that he gets to meet Titus again on his way. And guess what happens? He gets the good news. The church isn't doing so bad after all. The church is praying for Paul. And guess what? The church took care of that young man. And they kicked him out. And Paul's like, whoa. Finally. They're being obedient to the Lord. Paul said, I have no rest in my spirit. I don't know what his doubts were, but they were many. While this was the moment to rejoice, because there was an open door, am I plugged in now? hear me now? Thank you. The devil, if he can get into sound or get in the church, he'll start with the sound system. I'm convinced of that. <laughs> Paul had no rest in his spirit. It was heavy. And then all at once he hears word from Titus that the church is taking care of the matter and they're moving forward and they're doing okay. Paul had no rest in his spirit. I want to stop for a minute because even our greatest heroes, the book of James 5.17, it says even our greatest heroes are subjects to like passions that we have. Do you hear me? Even the people we admire the most are subject to the same passions of the flesh that we are. Paul was depressed. He was depressed. You remember Elijah in the Old Testament? You remember Elijah, that fire-bringing prophet of God? He goes up against, what was it, 450 prophets of Baal? They get out there, he tells them, he said, build an altar, cut the meat up, put it on there, don't put no water in it, and you pray, 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 and they get through praying, and they're just worn out. He said, you better, you better get serious to your God, your foreign God. They cut themselves up, pray, 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 nothing happens. And then Elijah says, here's an altar, here's the rocks, here's the meat, the sacrifice to my God, Jehovah. And he says, bring some water. And they pour it on the altar. Bring some more. Bring some more. Until they flood that place. That altar is permeated. There's water all around in the moat around it. And he gets on his knees and he prays, God, Jehovah, if you're faithful, bring down fire this day to prove that you're God. And boom! It licked the water up and consumed that altar. And then what does he do? He goes and he meets with a woman named Jezebel. And he is so fearful of her that he runs and hides in a cave. I, even our greatest heroes battle the flesh and weakness of the flesh. Remember David, the giant slayer? My hero. Until Bathsheba comes along. And immorality and murder takes the pride that we would have. Samson, the, the strongest man that ever lived. Hey, listen, a true superhero. You guys talk about Transformers, and you talk about Superman, and who are they? Batman, and, you know, uh, uh, Iron Man. And, let me tell you something. They're in the movies. Samson was a real man, a strong man. He killed a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey. Yeah. Let me tell you something. That's a he-man. And what does he do? He finds a beautiful woman that's a beautician. <laughs> and he, don't fall for the beautician. Do you hear me, Morris? Don't fall for the beautician. <laughs> His strength was the fact that he was 
faithful to God in what she did. He gave away his secret and what she cut his hair. He lost his strength. It's not me. Can you hear me? It's not me. Thank you. The Baptist David. This one on. Get up behind me, Satan. <laughs> so, Samson goes down. Peter, the bold preacher on the day of Pentecost, when thousands of people come to Christ, and what does he do? He's the same one that had denied Jesus three times, quit the ministry, walked away. That's why we sing in this hymn book that song, and I bet y'all didn't even notice it, hymn number 15. I love that last verse. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor Daily I'm consumed to be. Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter, find my wandering heart to thee. What kind of heart? Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Woo. Prone to wonder. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. That's what we're prone to do. Without Titus, Paul makes his journey to Troas, to the open door, a journey that brought him back to being a man <coughs> that God called him to be. Not depressed, not down and out, not thinking of the past, thinking about what laid ahead. Look at the first part of verse 14. Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. You hear that? No matter where you are or who you are or what you're going through, thanks be to God that always leads us to triumph in Jesus Christ. Listen, when a person like uh, Carol's son-in-law, when he passed from this life, let me tell you something, two years ago, he trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior. When he died during the night in his sleep, he just was transported from a bed to heaven. Listen, we are always led triumphantly through Jesus Christ, through cancer, through death, through sorrow, through sickness, through health issues, through turmoil, through, de through uh, depression. Jesus Christ is there to lead us through. If we'll just grab the hand of the one that's won victory over it all. Amen? Amen. Man. But we're prone to wonder. Paul said, I'm pressing forward. You know, one thing that I learned in my life overcoming polio, and the one thing that I learned running 70,000 miles and running 100 miles in 15 hours and 2 minutes, I will not accept the word defeat. I will not accept that word defeat. I am victorious in Jesus Christ. I can do all things through Jesus Christ who gives me strength. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. Amen. If sickness takes me, that's all right. I won the victory already. If I go through cancer again, guess what? The Lord is with me again. And then he picks up with this. I've got to hurry. Notice the last part of verse 14. The victory, yes. But notice he says, Through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Oh my goodness. How many of you have some kind of little instrument? I got to see how many of you have something at home that you plug your air wick or whatever it is, your freshener into? How many of you have one of those? You know, what, you know what that thing does? It diffuses the fragrance. Mine, you just plug them in, and the heat diffuses that, and it smells good. All through the house, my bathroom, thank goodness, my bedroom has them, the living room has them, the dining room has them, LaDonna's bathroom, thank goodness she's not in here, she's with the little ones, hers has one. I'm telling you, we got them all over the place, because you know what? I want our house to smell good. I don't like foul odors. How many of you like foul odors outside of Ronnie Brogdon and uh, Colby? <laughs> they love skunk oil. 
They use that stinking stuff. What do y'all use that for anyway? That's not going to attract anything except a skunk. Is that what you're trying to do, attract a skunk? Huh? Keep everything else away? It'll work for that. I guarantee you. But let me tell you something. Jesus Christ, who's won the victory, is the instrument that diffuses the fragrance of who he is. You understand me? There is nothing in this world sweeter than Jesus. Can I get a testimony, Miss Hazel? There's nothing in this world sweeter than Jesus. Can you raise your hand and say amen? Raise your hand. Amen. Nothing in this world is sweeter than Jesus. And the Lord uses us as a tool to diffuse that fragrance so people can smell it and say, Oh my, how good is that? And it's hard to stay right here. When that priest was ordained in the Old Testament to serve in the temple worship, that they anointed them with oil. Let me tell you something. That fragrance, that oil lingered for days and days. It lingered upon them. When they went to the marketplace, whoo, they smelled good. When they went home, whoo, they smelled good. When they went to the temple to worship or lead worship, whoo, they smelled good. And sometimes if the wind's blowing right, you'd smell them before they ever got there. And that is what we're supposed to be. A beautiful fragrance for Jesus Christ. But notice what he says in the next verse. We are to God the fragrance of Christ among those that are being saved and among those that are perishing. Thus the title of smelly Christian. So let me tell you something. If you allow Jesus in your life, and if you're walking and talking with Jesus every day, it's going to rub off on you. And the smell and the scent of Jesus is going to be picked up by other people. But I'm going to tell you something. If you're out there in the world, are you listening, young people? If you're out there in the world, if you're listening to the world's music, if you're living like the world, I'm going to tell you something. You're going to start smelling like the world. And when it comes to spiritual, you're not going to smell sweet like Jesus. You're going to smell stinky. Sour. Skunky. That's a word. That's what you're going to smell like. Amazing, isn't it? That word fragrance is translated odor. Same word used in John 12 where I read to the little kids about that moment of worship, one of the prettiest in all the Bible, where Mary anointed the body of Jesus and the fragrance filled the room. The smell of Jesus was all in that place. Mm. But I'm going to tell you what the church at Corinth had smelled like. They had smelled like the stench of the immoral young man that they had not kicked out. Sin stinks. It stinks. It had left a, a terrible stench in the nostrils of the community. While the, for the longest time, listen, for a long time, that young man living in immorality, he was a hindrance to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But the very moment, the very moment that Jesus Christ changed that young man and led him out of immorality to a place of brokenness and repentance, and that church family welcomed him back in, guess what? He was not a hindrance to the gospel. He was an advertisement of the gospel because the, the lost man came back home. The stinky man smelled good again because of Jesus Christ and who he was. That's the message Paul wants us to hear. Here's the question. What are others smelling of you? Do they smell the sweetness of Jesus Christ, the odor of Christ, or are they smelling something sour and offensive? That's the best way for the gospel to spread is when you smell the sweet aroma of Jesus. Because others smell it and they're like, wow. It's like when I buy my wife, sometimes on Valentine's, I buy her Japanese maple from uh, Bath and Body Works, and I'm like, oh my goodness. It reminds me of years gone by. 
So when I first smelled that, I'm like, Ooh. we're going to be sparking tonight. <laughs> Don't take that wrong now. <laughs> sparking for us is sitting down holding hands and watching two or three episodes of NCIS. <laughs> but understand me. While people are drawn to a sweet aroma, let me tell you something. People are offended by the stench of sin. Paul says it can be an aroma of life or an aroma of death. Matter of fact, you know people, some people, some people are allergic to smells. I remember a few months ago, uh, my buddy Wade came in and sat down in church one night. And it wasn't just a minute. He got up where he was sitting there. And he, he moved back. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, what did Patricia do? <laughs> or what did somebody say to him? And it was just a strong smell of perfume, and it makes him sick. Right, brother? It does. I want to tell you, that's what Paul says. Some people are drawn to the aroma of the gospel about Jesus Christ, and other people are going to be offended to it. Never more than today have we lived in a time that people don't want to hear about Jesus Christ. But I'm going to tell you something. They need to hear about Jesus. They need to smell and know that Jesus Christ is sweet. It's the mystery of grace. People are attracted to us or they're offended by us. It's the mystery of grace. It's the story of two boys that grow up in the same home, same parent, same environment, same love, same care, same provision, same teaching, same discipline. But when they become men, one turns to crime and the other turns to Christ. It's the mystery of grace. It's the world that we live in. Where people, they hear the story of Jesus dying and being buried and rising again. And one says, God, that stinks. And they go to perish in hell. And the other says, wow, I love that smell. How can I get it? Well, I can tell you how you can get that smell. That fragrance is only sold in one place. It's the storeroom of Jesus. Amen? Amen? The storeroom of Jesus. It's the story of the prodigal son. When they started cooking that fatted calf and roasting it out there, guess what? They put the robe on the son that had been wavered all of that time. And what did the other boy that stayed at home and was faithful to work and take care of the farm with his dad, what did he do? He became jealous. He became mad. He was upset. That's the world that we live in. All through the Bible, the fragrance of Christ draws some people. But I'm going to tell you, it damns others to a place called hell. Look at Cain and Abel. They had offerings. They had taught. They had, they had learned what God accepts. Cain brought an offering that God wouldn't accept. Abel brought one and God said, I'm pleased with it. What does Cain do? He kills his brother. Look at Esau and Jacob. Both of those young men, twins, came. Jacob chose the birthright and the blessing of the father. And Esau, what did he do? He grew up to live a profane and prodigal life. I'll tell you another. You remember Ruth and Oprah? How many of you remember that? Not Oprah, but Oprah. Remember? Both married the Limelech's sons. Both lost their husbands. Both were taught, taught the truth of God's word. Both made decisions to respond. Ruth, let me tell you about Ruth. Let me tell you about Ruth. Ruth chapter 1, verse 16. Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you. This is her mother-in-law, Naomi. Don't let me leave you or... I, or, or turn back from following after you. Wherever you go, I'll go. Wherever you lodge, I'll lodge. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. Sounds like a wedding, doesn't it? Where you die, I'll die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, as anything but death parts you and me. Wow. 
That young lady chose to follow Naomi and to follow God. And she marries a guy named Boaz, the great prince of Judah. Oprah, let me tell you about her. She went back to her old people, back to the dark world, back to the demonic gods of her people, back to a world that would reject Jesus Christ. Listen to me, folks. Listen, I'm going to shut up. Listen to me. The sweet fragrance of Jesus Christ is real. But the sour odor of this world is just as real. And you and I have to choose. We either take sweet or we choose the sour. Now, some of y'all like that sour candy, don't you? you do. I don't know what it is about it. I know Holden, I wish he was here because he'd give me some the other night. And I'm like, oh, goodness. I want sugar. The choice is ours. We choose the sweet or we choose the sour. We choose to walk and live our life in the sweetness of the Lord Jesus Christ or we choose the sourness of this world. And let me tell you something. I, 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 got, I got a hush, but verse 17, Paul says, We are not, as so many, peddling the word of God. I am not a peddler of the word of God. Listen to me, folks. Listen to me. I am not a peddler or a traitor of the word of God. I do not, and if I do tell you my opinion, I said, This is PB. This is what Pastor Buddy thinks. But let me tell you something. I don't peddle the Word of God. I don't trade the Word of God for my words. This is the truth of Almighty God. This is absolutely, solidly the very last thing that we can stand on. Amen? Are you with me? You can't fail when you stand on this book. You stand on my words, I'm going to stand very long. I do not peddle the Word of God. You want, you want to know why I don't peddle the Word of God? I'll tell you real quick. I'll give you the answer. Revelation 22, 18. I testify to everyone that hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anybody adds to these things, God will add to him the plague that are written in this book. And if you read Revelation, I don't want that. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, from the things which are written in this book. Let me tell you something. I'm going to stand and fall with this book. The world has a lot of words out there. But they will not stand the test of time. But this book will stand up until eternity with God begins. It's the mystery of grace. To save a life. To change a life. Or, let me tell you something. To reject Jesus Christ altogether. You do not know what God can do in your life until you take a step forward for Him. You do not know what God can do in your life until you raise a hand and say, Yes, Lord. You do not know what God can do in your life until you allow your heart to say yes to Him. Amen? In salvation or in obedience to Him. Look what he has done with just five sardines and two crackers. He fed a multitude of people. Look what he did with a slingshot and a stone. He took down a giant. Look what he did in this sinner's life. He took a wretched, ugly thing. Not handsome. But ain't ugly. Because in Jesus Christ I'm beautiful. He took this sinner and he calls him a saint. I know y'all don't think that sometimes, but he calls him a saint. You trust what God has done and what God can do. Amen? Amen. So let me ask you, what are you going to do? Are you going to continue to live the way you do and stink up the place? Are you going to make a change? Make a change in your life. Can you hear me, Miss Hazel? Yeah, a little bit. To make a change in your life. To put on the Lord Jesus Christ. To start 
letting go of the world and letting more of Jesus Christ come into your life so that the aroma is not so sour, the stench is not so strong, but people start smelling the fragrance of Jesus Christ in your life. The Bible says he is the sweet rose of Sharon. How many of you ever smelled a fresh rose like this one that I got from Miss Francis? He has. Did you hear that? That's what he said. He said, I have. Did you hear that? Author, did you hear him? I have. There's nothing like the sweet fragrance of a rose. That's Jesus. He's the lily of the valley. Not only smells good, guess what? It's pretty. It's pretty. It party. But you have to choose. Will you keep living the way that you live? Keep being the way that you've been? Or would you be willing to make a change? Would you be willing to let Jesus Christ make a difference in you? Let's pray. Father, I bow my head in my heart. And I thank you for not only the value of the word, but Lord, its truthfulness. But it also takes faith on our part. Our willingness to believe that word and to trust it enough that we're going to act on it. That, Lord, we're going to say, I don't want to be this way any longer. I want to change. Jesus, change me. And Father, I pray if there's one person here this morning that has listened to this message and they are aware now, like never before, that they do not have Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, that right now they would humble their heart and call upon the name of Jesus, because whoever does that will be saved. Lord, I pray for the rest of us, the many of us that are here, that we call ourselves children of God, that, God, we would check ourselves up front to see if the, the aroma that is coming from us, what is, what is coming out of us, is it, if it is a sweet fragrance, or if it's been a sour prayer. Then that God, we would come in repentance and admit that to you and ask you to begin to clean up our lives. Jesus, that you would become more and more and more important to us in the daily way we live our lives. Holy Spirit, I trust you right now to do what only you can do in convincing us of what we need most right now. Lord, may you be honored, not only with what you've heard us preach, but how we respond to that word, Jesus. In your sweet name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and say what number.